We would love for you to connect with us uh, so you can hear about our updates, our good news items that we share out with, with the community, um, and we hope that to build this out as an as important resource for all of you. Um, so to that end, um, I'd like to um, move into our program tonight. Uh, financial aid can be um, a, a critical piece of the uh, college admissions journey. So we have uh, with us a very knowledgeable expert um, on financial aid, uh, Mr. Will Kazane. He is the executive director of financial aid at the College of New Jersey. And here's, he is here to help us navigate financial aid tonight. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, maybe I'll start off like this. How many of you are ready to be overwhelmed? <laughs> all right, well good. I bet you if I ask you that same question at the end of the presentation, you're all gonna go, yes, okay? Because I have to tell you, although this is a nice, basic financial aid presentation, I am gonna overwhelm you. Because no matter how simple we try and put this, it's just a lot of information to take in, okay? So I've sent the presentation to the school. My hope is that they post it, okay? And my main goal of this is for you to at least be able to get a nice overview, hopefully you'll grasp some main concepts, and since you'll be able to refer back to the presentation, once you start getting all those financial aid packages, which we're gonna talk about in one of the sections here, you'll be able to go, you know what, I knew that guy will say something that rainy night in October, let me go back to the presentation and hopefully I can review it again and go, okay, this is what he was talking about, okay? So again, you know, I can guarantee you're gonna be overwhelmed, so it's, it's normal, so don't feel bad if you are, all right? So with that, let's get started. So what are we gonna to cover tonight? We're gonna to cover the types and sources of aid, the application process, the financial aid package, and then just other useful information. But before we start, Oh, and by the way, I didn't tell you today about myself. So I'm Executive Director of Financial Aid at the College of New Jersey. I've been in aid since 1989. I worked at uh, Middlesex County College. I was Associate Director of Grants and Scholarships for the state of New Jersey. Worked in the private sector, and now I'm at TCNJ. I've been there 12 years, and I absolutely love it. And we are your neighbors. So if your sons and daughters are thinking of going to college, absolutely come on by and, and visit us. It's a really, really nice place. So, and, not, and not only because I work there, okay? Uh, so before we start, so every college, university in the United States is required to have what's called a net price calculator, usually located on the, admit, on the financial aid websites, but sometimes it's also on the admissions websites, okay? What it is is it's a small, it's a really quick financial aid mini application. And you fill it out with your demographic stuff, it should take no more than hopefully two to five minutes to complete. And what it does is, based on how you answer the question, it tells you what the average freshman or first year student is receiving at that school. Again, based on your demographic input, okay? So it gives you an opportunity to know whether that school is generous with their financial aid or whether they're chintzy with their financial aid, okay? So as your sons and daughters are narrowing down their college searches, and let's say they're down to their top three, top five, I would recommend go out to the college's website, find their net price calculator, spend the two or five minutes on filling out the application, and get a result to see what a family like yours, sending a freshman year student at that school, receives an average on it. The data is usually like two years old, but you know, it's relatively close. The reason I like it is, is because again, not only do you know if the you know, if they're generous or chintzy with their aid, but also because it might help you start, you know, forging that conversation as to, well, you know, your third choice school seems to be very generous with their aid. So perhaps you really need to pay attention to that school. Hopefully you'll get in, pay attention when their financial aid package comes out and you receive it. Okay, so it's just a good tool for you to use. So when you apply for financial aid, we're going to go over, over the applications in the next section. When you apply for financial aid, that application, that FAFSA, is being sent to the sources of aid that you see on the left. So that form is going to the federal government for processing. It's being sent to the state of New Jersey for processing. 
and is being sent to every college and university that you indicate on that form for processing. Each of those entities, I don't know what that belief is, each of those entities is evaluating you for the types of aid that you see on the right. So the federal government is evaluating you for grants, scholarships, student loans, and employment opportunities. The state of New Jersey is receiving it, they are doing the same thing. Each college and university is receiving it, and they're doing the exact same thing. So that one application, that main one that I'm going to talk about in the next section, is kind of like one size fits all, doing everything. I'm going to talk about two other applications, but the main one does this. Okay, so it's not like you're like, I gotta fill out this form for this type of aid, I gotta fill out this form for this type of aid, I gotta fill out, I gotta send that over here. No. One form is doing it all. Being sent to all the entities on the left to be evaluated for the types of aid on the right. So some of the types of aid that you're going to be evaluated, oh, before I get there. So I want to show you this slide. So I'm showing you this slide for transparency purposes. All right, so maybe set some expectations, all right? So for federal aid, traditionally, in order to get federal need-based aid, the household income needs to be under $100,000 a year, okay? If you're over $100,000 a year, I want you to set the expectations of going, hmm, okay. We gotta start looking at other sources of aid, which we're gonna cover, but I gotta start thinking about other sources of aid. Okay? But traditionally, under $100,000, $100,000 seems to be the magic figure lately. Okay? So, types of aid, federal. And these are need based grants, so that income is gonna be the main evaluator of eligibility. Alright? Federal government. So, currently, their signature program is called the Pell Grant Program. Maximum award $68.95. It is expected to go up next year, but we don't know how much. Okay. And again, it's needs based aid. They'll receive the form. That federal processor will evaluate it, and they will let the school know if you qualify and for how much. Other type of aid is SCOG. That stands for Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. Maximum there $4,000. Basically, the way that one works is. The federal government sends money to each school. The school receives a FAFSA results, and based on those results, they evaluate if you qualify for that aid, and you will be awarded that funding. Okay? And teach. Um, they've been talking about this for a few years. The federal government established the program, but it seems to be taking more of an importance lately, especially uh, the teacher shortage has really been highlighted now after COVID. So they're really pushing for. If students are thinking of going into a teaching career, the federal government is giving them up to $3,772 per year in the TEACH grant. There is a commitment to teach, certain majors, certain areas, but they're really, really pushing this program because of the teacher shortage, especially in highlighted in New Jersey. So I'm sure if you do a Google search and look up articles, it'll pop up, okay? So these are some of the federal programs that you're going to be evaluated for, all right? State of New Jersey, again, that form is going to the state of New Jersey, you're being evaluated for state of New Jersey programs. Now you see state of New Jersey programs has a lot of programs that you'll be evaluated for, okay? One caveat with the state of New Jersey program. So unlike the federal, where it's a federal program, if you qualify, you can go to any college in the U.S. and receive those funds. For the state of New Jersey, you must be a New Jersey resident and you must be attending a New Jersey school. So even if that FAFSA goes to the state, and the state says you qualify for funding. If you leave New Jersey to go study somewhere else, you will not receive those funds. So again, a New Jersey resident must be attending a New Jersey school. And the state of New Jersey also tailors their programs to the type of school you're going to. All right? Their signature program is called the Full-Time Tag Program. That stands for Tuition Aid Grant, okay? You see award amounts there, 1,280 to 13,590, and those are yearly amounts. So what happens is, again, the state of New Jersey, that 1,280 that you see there, that's a community college award. So the state of New Jersey, depending on where you're studying, if you qualify, they're going to tailor that award to the type of school. Obviously, we know community colleges are relatively inexpensive. So the state of New Jersey says, you want to a community college, you're going to receive the 1,280 award. If you're going to a private institution, let's say you're going to Ryder, Drew, Centenary, Monmouth, one of those, those are much more expensive. That 13590 is their award 
at those entities, at those schools. At TCNG, I'm averaging about $9,000 per year, so I'm kind of somewhere in between there as a state school. Okay? So again, some uniqueness about the New Jersey programs. New Jersey resident attending a New Jersey school, different program, many more than the federal government, and those awards are tabled. Now, <clears throat> in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over each one of these programs with you, because not be here three hours, and you don't want that. So what I've done is, I'm giving you your first homework assignment. So again, I told you the presentation is going to be posted. Hopefully you can refer back to it. And each one of the programs that's outlined on this slide has their own individual slide telling you what the criteria is, the qualification, okay? One of the other things you're going to notice, unlike the federal programs which are all need-based based on income, the state of New Jersey has need-based based on income, but also they have merit-based programs based on how well you did in high school, class rank, things like that. So each one of those, not only is it described, but then it'll tell you whether it's a need-based program or whether it's a merit-based program. Or the, probably the ones a lot of people know about are the End Your Stars program, merit-based program. Graduate from high school, certain uh, class rank, you can attend your local community college tuition and uh, uh, tuition free for the first two and a half years, and then you can transfer to a four-year school like TCNJ under the STARS 2 program, okay? So again, need and merit these are some of the things that come into play, all right? But again, I'm giving you a slide for each one. And by the way, if you have questions, raise your hands, all right? We can do questions at the end, but also if you have a question about a slide, you're unsure, I'm gonna repeat something, raise your hand and we can address it, you know, while the presentation is going, all right? I'm not shy. All right, state grants, so again, you have Governor Zervin, you have Community College Opportunity Grant, depending on your income. Uh, Garden State Guarantee, which is at a school like mine. So again, each one of these has a description. And it you know, tells you the programs uh, and what the eligibility criteria is, whether it's income, need-based, things like that. Uh, three plus one degree completion. Oh, and then we get to student loans, okay? So this is kind of like the third section. So student loans. So unlike the federal program, which is need-based and you so you needed that 100,000 income and below to uh, potentially qualify in the state. With student loans, there is no income limit. You can make a million dollars a year and you can qualify for a student loan, okay? Now the loans that I'm gonna describe here are loans in the student's name only. Parents are not part of this yet, okay? So again, you need to complete the federal application for financial aid. You're going to be evaluated to see if you qualify. And again, there's no income limit, so the student is going to automatically qualify for a loan. Where the evaluation comes into play is there's different types of loans. Okay, there's two types actually. All right. So again, the way these loan works are it's only for the student. There is no credit check. The student qualifies regardless of household income. And repayment on these loans begins six months after the student graduates. So that's the overall criteria. Now where the evaluation comes in is there are two types of student loans. One is called subsidized, one is called unsubsidized. So on both loans, again, the principal is deferred while the student is in school and repayment okay, begins after they graduate. Subsidized means that the federal government is paying for the interest on that loan while the student is in school. Unsubsidized means the interest comes due immediately. Okay? That's where the evaluation process is going to come in, that financial aid application. The school is going to determine which one, if not both, the student qualifies for, whether the student qualifies for the one that the interest is covered by the government, or that the interest is due immediately. Okay? But the school is going to make that determination on the FAFSA. So again, it's just so that you know that this is potentially what could be coming down. Right? So that's in the student's name only. Okay? The only other issue with these loans is you're going to notice the amounts are not very high. So if you were to look, you see grade level, freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors, and beyond, the cumulative limit, limit, and you see dependent, probably most students here will fall into the dependent category, okay? So you see there for freshmen, the amount is $5,500 for the year. So these loans are meant to basically supplement any other type of aid that the student may be eligible for, okay? That's why the amounts are low. All right. 
And you see there where it says max 3,500 subsidized. That means that that one where principal and interest is covered by the federal government, the maximum you can get is 3,500. That additional 2,000 would be in an unsubsidized loan. Okay. So again, little nuances there. All right. And then you see it grows, you know, by thousand dollars sophomore year, and then junior and senior year goes up to seventy five hundred. Okay. Then we get into types of loan that are now the student and the parent could apply for. The only thing is, these are a little bit more restrictive. So the federal loan in the student's name has no credit check. The student can apply for it and receive it automatically by completing that FAFSA. These are loans that require a credit check. So traditionally what happens is the student applies and because they have no credit or they don't have a steady job or their income is not high enough, they get declined. And then either a parent or a guardian co-signs, or in some cases I have parents that say I'm going to let my son and daughter borrow on the federal program that they automatically qualify for, and any difference I will borrow on their behalf to help pay for college. Okay? So the first program I want to point out is again a state of New Jersey loan program. Okay? What I like about the state of New Jersey loan program, besides the fact that the student can apply and deny, the parent can co-sign or the parent can apply outright, is that they have a lot of different repayment options. Okay? It'll, uh, and even the, the length of the repayment. So for example, you could pick a 10-year repayment option with them, a 15-year repayment option, a 20-year repayment option, so you can decide how long you want to be paying out that loan. And obviously you know, the longer the term period, the lower the loan, but then the more interest you pay, all right? So we're pretty basic for all you mortgage holders out here. Uh, then they also have one that is an immediate repayment. You can say, okay, I'm gonna take out the loan, 10 years, but I'm gonna start paying the entire amount while I'm in school. Or I'm going to take out the loan, I'm going to pick 15 or 20 or whatever, but I'm only going to pay interest while the student is in, in school. Or I could say, you know what, I am going to defer the entire amount and I will begin to make payments once my son and daughter graduates. Okay? So not only do you have the different repayment in terms of years, but also, you know, depending on your cash flow, you can say, you know what, no, I'm just going to pay interest because you know, I got a payment plan going and there's other things going on in my life. I might have a second one going to college. So again, so that's how the state of New Jersey program works. Okay? Federal government has their own loan program. It's called PLUS, Parent Loan for Undergraduate Student. Okay? This one a little bit more restrictive because this one is only available to the parent. The student cannot borrow. Okay? Repayment, you can stretch it out as far as 25 years. Okay? And the only other thing on that one is repayment begins immediately. So unlike the state of New Jersey one that you can say, you know, I'll do interest only or I won't pay anything or I'll pay the whole amount right now, you know, as I'm going monthly. No, on that one it's as soon as the money is sent to the college to pay for that first year of school, you begin to make your monthly payments on the loan. It's a little bit more restrictive there. And then finally the other one is, again, where the parent or the student can borrow private educational loans like for banks, from lenders. What we're trying to do here is we're just trying to give you, again, options, okay? You are eventually going to be shopping for the product if student loans are what you're going to need to, to borrow on to pay for college. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to tell you, look, state of New Jersey has a program. Federal government has a program. The regular banks have a program, okay? You may go to your bank, say your PNC, or let's say you do TD Bank or whatever, and you have a mortgage with them. You might have your line of credit, let's say you have a small business, you have a business with them, your credit for your business. You may say, hey, look, you know, my son's daughter's ready to go to college. You give out student loans, and they say yes. And you say, well, what are your you know, interest rates, what are your repayment rates? And they say, hey, you know, as a matter of fact, right now, you're a good customer, and you get a discount on the interest. We have a 2.99 over 15 years. And then when you look at the federal and the state, you're like, wait a second, that's a really good rate. So I'm going to go with that product. Okay? So traditionally, these entities are all competing with each other. And you might find one year that the federal government has a better option, and then another year the state has the better option. Right now, I think the state has the better option this year, but that might change next year. Okay, so again, all you're doing is you're shopping, you're educating yourself. If that, this is something you're gonna have to do, you're looking at the different options to see what is the best option for your family in order to be able to afford college, okay? And then finally, we get to institutional merit 
or talent based data. Okay? So consider part of financial aid. Now, any merit aid, you do not need the financial aid form to complete. But I'm going to explain to you why you should still do it for need based aid, for the institution. So this is basically institutional aid coming from the individual college and university that you're going to be evaluated for. And basically the way merit aid works is your, your sons and daughters are applying for admissions at the different colleges and universities. As the admissions folks are reading their application and they're saying, are we going to admit Johnny or are we going to admit Sue to our school? They're also going, you know what? This is a really good candidate. He's applying for accounting. And we could use accounting majors, you know? And they may say, we really want this student here. So what they will probably do is they'll say, okay, not only are we going to offer that student admissions, but we're also going to offer that student an institutional merit scholarship to try and entice them to come to our school. Okay, and that comes solely from admissions. Now, they could be looking at a myriad of factors to make those determinations. And those factors could change every year. And just here are some of the factors that could influence that. Okay? Some schools may say, well, we're really big on AP scores and transferring AP credits. And another one may say, well, we are not test optional. You're required to provide the SATs because that's the gauge we use to determine our institutional money. Another school may say, well, what was your high school track? What kind of high school did you go to? What was your GPA, your class rank? So you don't know. You don't know any of this. I don't know any of this from my admissions office, and I don't want to know. Or when people ask me, I say, I don't know. Talk to admissions. Okay? and it can change from year to year. So this is really where you're gonna have the most flexibility because you don't know how each school is gonna treat your son and daughter or what factors each school is looking at, okay? But this is gonna be part of the admissions application, all right? What's gonna happen though is, is then the college, or what we'll do it, that they do at TCNJ is once they pick their merit candidates, then they send me those lists of financial aid and then they said, does the student have any need-based institutional eligibility based on the FAFSA results? And then I have my own need-based criteria, we have our own income cutoffs, and then I go, as a matter of fact, the student does. And then what we will do is we will supplement any money that admissions is giving the student with institutional need-based aid. So for example, let's say the student is admitted and admissions decides to offer that student $10,000 per year merit scholarship would be renewable over four, four years, so $40,000, okay? They send me the list, and then based on the FAFSA results, we look, and the student meets one of our income criteria, and then we say, as a matter of fact, they meet the need criteria as well. Let's supplement that $10,000 with an additional $3,000 in need based aid. You see, so now the student receives $13,000 per year in institutional funding. And again, this is just one part, you know, they may, maybe they're eligible for power now, maybe they're eligible for state or not, maybe you're looking at student loans, whatever. So we're just trying to piece together as much aid from different sources to see if the student qualifies and be able to accomplish them properly. Okay? So that's how the institution works. All right? Any questions so far? A little overwhelmed? All right, question here. Well, the only thing that's going to be different for outside of New Jersey is New Jersey aid. Because the federal is federal. The loans are loans that they don't matter either, you know. And even for the state of New Jersey program, since you're a New Jersey resident, you can borrow on the state of New Jersey program and they will allow that money to go outside. It's the grants that stay within New Jersey. And the institution, each institution is going to, you know, they're an outside institution. That's their own criteria for that institution. So really it's just the New Jersey state aid that is different. All right, so the applications. I'm going to go over three applications. Two of them are rarely used. The third one is the one that everybody would complete to apply for the types of aid that I covered in section one. All right? First application I'm going to go over is the New Jersey Dreamer application. Now, uh, basic tenet of financial aid. In order to apply for federal aid and be eligible for federal aid, and even at a lot of institutions, in order to apply and be eligible, the student must be a U.S. citizen or eligible non-citizen. In other 
tours there here on their permanent status. Okay? Now, New Jersey allows undocumented students to apply for New Jersey State aid only. Okay? And that's what this application is. Okay? They call it the New Jersey Dreamer application, but it's really an undocumented student application. Again, only limited amount of aid, so there's only three state programs that allow students to apply as an undocumented student. Uh, they can go right to hisa.org and give the website. I don't know if it applies to anybody here, but you can go to hisa.org. You can go to their website. You can look at the criteria, who should complete the application, and you can apply. The student will be evaluated by the state of New Jersey, and if they are eligible, they will notify the school. The only thing you got to remember is it must be a New Jersey school. If the student is undocumented applying for a New Jersey aid and they're eligible, they can't take that with them outside of New Jersey. Okay, so again, very limited amount of students that apply uh, for this type of aid. So that's one application. The second one is called the CSS profile on the college board. Okay? Now on this one, only 400 colleges or scholarship entities nationally require this form. Okay? Only one school in New Jersey requires this form on top of the FAFSA. And it's Stevens Institute of Technology. So unless you're going to Stevens Institute in New Jersey, you don't have to worry about this form. Traditionally, I say for those of you or for those students that are considering going outside of New Jersey, you need to either go to the CSS website and look at the schools that require this profile, okay, or go to the school's website and see if they require this, okay? So this is like an additional application, a supplemental application on top of the FAFSA. CSS profile is traditionally for schools, private schools, that give out a lot of institutional money. And what they're trying to do is, before they're going to award a student a forty or even a $50,000 a year scholarship, they want to really scrutinize your household's finances. Okay? So for example, CSS profile costs money. You make uh, under 100, it's free, but if you make over 100, you've got to pay. $25 in one college, each additional college is $16. CSS profile will ask you about your home. When did you buy it? How much do you want a mortgage? What's the equity on the home? Because the profile school may want you to borrow on the equity of that home to help pay for college before they give you any money. Okay? CSS profile is going to ask you potentially about your retirement. How much do you have set aside for retirement? How much are you contributing towards retirement? Because they may say, we want you to pull back on those contributions and use some of that money to help pay for college. See, FAFSA doesn't ask you any of that stuff, okay? FAFSA only wants to know for divorced parents about the custodial parent information, and that's what's going to go on the FAFSA. The profile will probably ask you about non-custodial parent and their income and what their household situation is, you see? So a lot more thorough and intense, longer than the FAFSA. But again, only 400 entities required in the U.S. So again, mostly for the out-of-staters. Those of you going to study out-of-state, because in New Jersey, it's only Stevens. Okay? So again, you should go out to the school's website or their website to look up to see if this is an additional form that you're going to be required to fill out. But the one that everybody's going to have to complete is called the FAFSA. Free application for federal student aid. This is that form that on that first slide is going to go to all those sources that you saw, federal, state, and colleges, and you're going to be evaluated for all those types of aid that we covered in Section 1, okay? The FAFSA for 2324. so this is for the seniors in the room. I know there were some junior parents in the room, and I'm glad you're here. This is a nice primer for you, but it's too early, okay? So hopefully we'll see you back next year, and you'll be less overwhelmed, okay? Uh, for all you senior parents in the room, for those of you whose sons and daughters are going to start college their freshman year, August of 23, this is the form you're going to complete. Okay? It is available now. It opened up on Saturday. Okay? It collects the family's personal and financial information. You do it online. It uses 2021 income information. Okay? You can even log into the IRS site and populate the income from the IRS to the FAFSA. So this is the form that you are going to be using to apply for financial aid for your sons and daughters your first year. And you complete the FAFSA every year. Because every year, your income can change, and they really want to see what the ups and downs are. Yes, sir? 
dollars. Okay. Okay. So you filled that fast already for your oldest son last year. Absolutely. The student is the individual applying for it. Okay. The student will need your parents' information. So let's say I'm applying for it. My brother John is going to apply for it. My sister Sue is going to apply for it. Each of us are applying for financial aid. Even though we all have the same parent and the same parent's information is going to go on it, each of us has to do our own form. No, hold on a second. So, you have your own FSA ID, your own FAFSA account. So you can sign your one son's FAFSA. When your other son does his own FAFSA, you can use that same account information on his too. Okay? Each one of your kids has to do their own FAFSA. But your ID will be good for all of your kids. It opened up October 1. The deadline is according to the school. You have to go to each school's website and see when do they need that FAFSA buy in order for them to evaluate you and hopefully award you aid before your sons and daughters have to make a decision about going there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Each school has their own deadline there. So mine's February 15th. Oh, no, no, no. Most schools' deadline dates will be like January, February, you know, in March, things like that. Well, it just opened on Saturday, so you may have been working on it on the past week and it just wasn't available. Okay. All right. All right. And so then what happens is, there's another step, which you, you probably haven't beat already, sir, but... So remember back in the day, you know, when the FAFSA was paper. It was the time when the FAFSA was paper, and as soon as you did the FAFSA, at the end, the student had to sign it, and then the parent had to sign it, and you mailed it out. Okay? And those days are gone. So now, the way you sign it is electronic. And that electronic signature is called an FSA ID. All right? So you have to apply for that FSA ID when your sons and daughters are filling out the FAFSA. So again, the student is applying for aid, okay? Mom and dad are sitting over their shoulder assisting them with their information. And the student has to apply for their own FSA ID, their electronic signature. And one parent in the household has to apply for the FSA ID. Okay? That's how it works. What I've done is, because the FSA ID sometimes can get confusing, the best tool for you to learn about this is go out to YouTube. All right? You've got the link right here. You can go out to YouTube and you can type in on the search how to create an FSA ID. It's a six minute video on how to do it. I think it's the best, the easiest, and I could talk to you for a half hour and this will do a much better job, okay? As a matter of fact, the beauty about this is, is then you're gonna have other videos on the recommended, on things like how to fill out your fast, and troubleshooting your account, things like that. So I think it's a real handy tool. Just like all of my tutorials at TCNJ for new incoming students and all that, I have tutorials, I send them right out to YouTube. I have recorded videos that are posted on YouTube. Okay, I think it's the best tool. So, again, YouTube is your friend, all right? It's not just for entertainment, so. Uh, but yeah, you'll have to create an FSA ID. That's your electronic signature, okay? The FAFSA. There are 103 questions on the FAFSA, all right? So traditionally, USD tells me it takes about 63 minutes on average to complete the FAFSA. Now, I'm not telling that to scare you. I'm telling you that so that you can take your time when it's time to fill out the FAFSA. Okay? Now, the nice thing about it is probably 80% of the questions on the FAFSA are all demographic questions. You know, your name, your address, your year of study, your major. Are you going to be living on campus? Do you want to work on campus? Are you interested in work opportunities? You see, most of it is stuff like that, which should not be difficult to answer. It's that 20% income, assets, benefits that are the toughest, okay? But the bottom line is, is this is an important document. You don't want to mess this up. You don't want to make any mistakes, okay? 
So make sure that when it comes time to fill it out, set some time aside with your son and daughter, sit down, be ready to spend an hour plus on it, okay? And be patient. Yes? They delayed it. Yes, FAFSA is, was supposed to be simplified. You're right. It's been delayed. Originally it was moved, it was supposed to be this, this coming year, then they moved it to 24, 25, so now we're not sure if 24, 25, or even 25, 26, right? You know what, you weren't dreaming. It's just that it's been delayed, absolutely. Good point. All right, so again, just take your time. That's all I'm telling you on this, on this section, all right? And you know, the beauty is you're doing it online, so it's intuitive, it's gonna, send you down the path you know, that, that belongs to you, okay? And if a question does not apply to you, it will even skip that question, so that's a nice thing. So general eligibility requirements, they're real basic and simple. Uh, student must have a valid social security number, okay? Student must be U.S. citizen or eligible non-citizen, okay? But the main one is the second bullet, let me switch these around. Student must be enrolled or accepted for enrollment in an eligible program of study and they need to be pursuing a degree, a certificate, something, okay? In other words, the student has to apply, the student has to be accepted, and the student has to be there with a purpose. Whether that purpose is, hey, I'm at a vocational school and I want to get a certificate in, you know, diesel engine overhaul, you know, or cosmetology, or I'm there for my associates, or my bachelor's, or my master's. You could be there undeclared your first two years, as some students don't know what they want to study, and eventually they're going to have to declare a major, but you need to have been admitted with a purpose. If you're there visiting, if you're there taking courses part time to discover yourself, if you're not sure what you want to do, you know, you haven't applied, whatever, you're just taking random courses, you're not going to get financial aid. They want you there for a purpose, for an end goal. Because some aid is limited. You know, some aid you can only get for six years, you know, or four years, four and a half years, or whatever. So you're there for a purpose, okay? Key components, and again, most of the FAFSA questions are biographical, demographics, I should say. You know, your name, social security, date of birth, you know, driver's license if you have one. Uh, there's going to be income and asset questions. There's going to be about 15 questions that determine whether just your information, the student's information goes on the FAFSA, or the student and the parent's information goes on the FAFSA. Those are the dependency questions. There's going to be parent demographic information. That's why the parents need to be there to assist the student. Technically, the student should be driving. And I know a lot of parents fill out their form for their kids, but then their kids are their freshman and sophomore year go to the financial aid office and they have no clue about their financial aid. Okay? That's why you got to make your kids drive or drive a little at least so they have some clue of what's going on, all right? More components, household size, number in college, income, federal means tested benefits. So these are all just components of the formula, okay? So part of the questions. Now, the main one I want to point out is that last one. List all colleges of interest up to 10. So what happens with the FAFSA is you can only do 10 colleges per submission, all right? So, let's say your son and daughter wants to apply to 30 schools. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna fill out the FAFSA, you're gonna put in 10 colleges, and you're gonna submit it. FAFSA takes about 48 to 72 hours to process, and then once it's processed, the student is gonna get an email at the email address they used on the FAFSA, okay? That tells them, hey, your FAFSA's been processed. They should look through that FAFSA to make sure they didn't make any errors and it's going to have the 10 colleges they put down. That means that those 10 colleges are going to have access to that data to evaluate them for eligibility for the programs, okay? But then let's say your sons and daughters want to apply for more college. So what will happen is, after it's processed, they'll have to log back into the FAFSA, delete the first 10 colleges, add 10 new ones, and resubmit. The original 10 are not going to change. They still are going to get the data. They're going to have access to it. But now 10 new schools within two or three days will now have access to that data. Okay? So that's good, like, for you know, let's say you're visiting schools, you want to do the FAFSA, you want to meet a deadline, and right now you're like, well, we know about four colleges, you know, so we're going to submit the FAFSA to meet deadlines at these schools and put those four colleges, but then you decide, 
oh, you know, we have another college visit in December, you can go out and we're like, well, you know, we really like this school. You can just log back into your FAFSA at that school and resubmit. And now that school's going to have access to the data. Okay, so you can continue to do that. And again, since the FAFSA is free, you can put 100 colleges in there. Okay? Because as you're going to see in the next section, not all of them are going to package you free. Okay? Yellow. Um, you know what? Battery's running low, if you wouldn't mind plugging this in. FAFSA submission page. Uh, I, you know, this is probably one of the only pages on the FAFSA that says print this page. So I think it's pretty important. Then. So I always tell everybody, you know, in your FAFSA folder, you know, you should have a FAFSA folder, you know, with that lines and all your information, your taxes. But I would definitely recommend you print this page and keep it. Okay. The reason for that is, is uh, the student when he submits the FAFSA, he or she, they get what's called a data release number. It's a unique identifier. It's kind of like their FAFSA social security number, let's say. So I always recommend to keep the page because if God forbid there's a school that doesn't get your information from the schools you listed, you can always call the school and tell them I did my FAFSA. They may say, give us the DRN number and then they'll be able to locate the FAFSA and pull it in. Also, the FAFSA gives you kind of like a little estimate. You know, expect the family contribution. It'll tell you if you see on the Lower left there, you know, Pell Grant estimated. It'll tell you if you qualify for a Pell Grant, how much potentially you could qualify for. And if you qualify for a federal loan, it gives you a little estimate of what you would qualify for. Okay, so, hold on a second. Do you have, oh, you have the, the plug-in? The actual charge? Yeah, that's what, that's what needs to be done. Yeah, that, everything's fine. It's just it's running low on battery. It just needs to be plugged in so the presentation doesn't go black. All right. Skip through this one. So, like I said before, remember the federal government, the state, and the school is receiving all that FAFSA data. If once those entities receive the FAFSA data, if they need any more information from you, we're going to reach out. Okay? And I want to explain to you uh, what happens in, on the federal end and on the state end. I'm not on the school end. So, if the federal government needs more information from the student, to process the FAFSA, they will notify the school, and then the school is going to reach out to the student via email. Okay? Traditionally, we will reach out to the student at the school level at the same email address he or she used on the common application. So you want to make sure that that's a good, valid email. All right? And you don't want to use a school email because that email will be gone once they graduate in June. Okay? So use a personal email. Okay? If the school needs something from the student in order to evaluate or complete that FAFSA, they will also reach out to the student via that email. Okay? So the federal government will tell the school, the school will reach out. If the school needs it, they will reach out directly. Okay? The reason I tell you this is because the state of New Jersey is also going to get that FAFSA data. But if they need any information from the student, they don't like to go through the school. They like to go directly to the student. So sometimes what I end up getting, and this happened to my babysitter a couple of years ago, she, uh, she was at OCC, she applied, and she came to me like, and she goes, you know, well, I've been getting these emails from this HESA folks asking me for more information, I'm afraid, you know? She'd been getting them for months, and they were like trying to reach out to her to go, we need more information because you're potentially eligible for state money, but she kept ignoring it because she thought it was spam, okay? So again, you should always be careful with, you know, emails that you respond to or whatever, or if you're unsure of something, you should reach out to the entity, reach out to the school, reach out to whoever, okay? But again, the school and the federal government will reach out to you through the school, the state reaches out to students directly, so that can be a little confusing. And I'm going to give you the telephone number for the state at the very end, which you can always call them uh, for assistance too. So just keep that in mind. That's a little uh, weird part, okay? And again, I, I always recommend if you're unsure, you know, reach out to the school and just go, you, know, you send me this, are you sure? Oh, I got this from the state. And then there's a yes, yes, the state is asking for stuff. Please respond to them directly, okay? So the awards. All right, so you saw in section one, there's different types of aid. Go on to different entities, different types of aid you're going to be evaluated for. Some are need-based. Some are merit-based. 
you saw in section two that everybody has to do the FAFSA, but there's potentially, you know, for undocumented students, they have their own application, and some schools require an additional uh, application at CSS profile. All of that is basically to get you to this step, the financial aid awards, okay? How much am I going to qualify for? But there's going to be a couple of things that go on in the background. So I just want you to explain so you understand why you could put a hundred colleges on your class. You could put ten on ten different submissions. But until the student is actually accepted at that school, the school will not pull in the data to evaluate that student's eligibility. So only an accepted student. So you may put a hundred. And in the end, your son and daughter is only accepted 15, but well, only 15 are going to go through this process of evaluating them and awarding them financial aid. Okay, because there's a lot of things that happen in the background, so I just wanted to make it nice and simplified for you. So the first thing schools are going to look at is what's called the cost of attendance, or COA. And it's how much does it cost to go to that school for the first year. And these are some of the things they look at in establishing that cost. Standard, tuition, fees, room, board, books, supplies, equipment, transportation. So if the student is in their junior year, they're going to go study in Florence or Milan or Heidelberg, Germany, wherever, there's going to be extra cost. There's health insurance involved. If the student has to buy a laptop that first year as part of their program, they're going to look at all those costs and they're going to establish the cost of attendance. So that's step number one. Step number two is the FAFSA results. The student has been accepted. Now they're going to access that FAFSA data pull it into their computer system, and begin the evaluation process for the types and amount of aid that that student may qualify for, okay, including loans, okay? So that's step number two, and it's all derived on what's called the EFC, Expected Family Contribution, okay? And that's just a FAFSA formula that determines that number, all right? So I'll give you an example of sample EFC for the Smith family. So in this situation, Family lives in New Jersey, mom and dad are married, there are four in the household, and their first child is going to college. So it's four and one, okay? Uh, parents adjusted gross income for 2021 was $99,000. Assets is $15,000. Student had no income and assets uh, in 2021. So the federal government, based on their formula, determined that this family can contribute about 15% of their income and assets towards the child's first year of school. So the EFC is 15000 in this case, or let's say $15,000 to make it more simpler, okay? So after they've done that, we pull in this data, and then we establish what's called financial need, all right? So we look at that cost of attendance, the first thing. Actually, well, we'll look at the types of colleges, because each college costs different, each sector. So we know that community colleges are the cheapest, okay? So the community colleges have established that it's about $8,000 a year on average to attend the school. There's no room and board on campus. You know, there's usually maybe some transportation costs. Traditionally, it's just tuition, fees, books, and maybe transportation. So they're the cheapest on uh, in town, right? So it's about $8,000 for the year. State College University, my sector, $30,000 a year. Now, in there, we're looking at tuition, fees, room, board, if you were to add my books uh, to that, I'd probably jump into about 31 a year, okay? But that's right around the area of what it costs to come to TCNJ for the full year, you know, everything all in. And then private college university, let's say we'll look at a Ryder University, they are gonna be more expensive. They are a private school, they're not um, supported by the state of New Jersey, so they are more expensive, okay? So private college university is about $60,000 a year. Then there's the EFC, what the FAFSA determined the family can contribute for the first year of school. So that's the constant. Doesn't matter where you go, that's always going to be the same. And then the college establishes what's called financial need, okay? So as you can see on the community college sector, you see that this family has what's called no need. Because FAFSA determined they could pay more for a year of college than what it costs to go to that community. When I was in Middlesex, we had no obligation to package these families with aid. We would send them a standard canned letter, basically saying, here's the cost, here's what the fast determined you can pay, you have no need, we have no responsibility to give you aid. If you still have questions, or you're looking at loans, or you can't meet the $15,000 responsibility, come talk to us, okay? We send thousands of those letters, so. State College University, on my end, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to find you enough financial aid 
which would include loans, to meet that $15,000 need. Okay? Now, if the student is eligible for more funding, then whoop de doo to you. We're not going to take that away or bring it down to 15. That means great. Not only have you met your need, but you've eaten into your contribution as well. Traditionally, what I get is either you find the 15 and then they're like, 15,000? The feds are crazy. I can't afford 15. What options do I have then? Or we try and try and try and we can't find the 15 for financial need. And we say we can only find X. Okay? We're going to have to figure out how you're going to pay the difference, whether it's a payment plan or some other mechanism. Okay? And then you see that that gap grows even larger at the private college and university. Okay? Now, traditionally, this is where I say, look, as a state entity, my pockets aren't as deep as perhaps some private schools. Okay? The private schools realize that they have to be very generous in the aid they're giving in order for a family to be able to afford that additional $45,000 need that they have there. Okay? So what I traditionally say to families is, look, if your sons and daughters have a private school or two that they're really interested in, don't dissuade them from applying. Okay, don't look at the sticker price and go, oh my gosh, you know, this is just ridiculous. I want to send them to a state school and community college. Because you never know, I have plenty of private schools that beat my pants when it comes to uh, packages. Because they realize that unless we gave them a lot of money, they're not going to be able to afford to come here. Okay? So again, I'm not saying apply to 10 privates, you know, it's 70 grand a year. But if there's really an interest, don't dissuade them from not applying. See where the chips fall, because in the end, maybe you only lost a, an application fee. Okay? Uh, but again, I have plenty of examples where some private colleges aren't you know, able to beat my package because I don't have as deep a pockets as they do. Okay? So basically, this is the gist you know, of how we establish that need. And in the end, it's just to send you your award notices so you can begin to compare. All right, my son applied to seven schools. He got into seven schools. And here are all the award notices from the seven schools. And this is where the rubber hits the road. Now we have to sit down and go, what can mom and dad afford based on the cost of that school and the type of financial aid or the amount of financial aid that we are receiving, okay? And this is where, again, that net price calculator from the front may be like, well, I remember, you know, the first choice was chintzy with their aid. But meanwhile, my son or daughter's third choice is being very generous with their aid and a really good package. So we really need to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation to go, you know, if you go to Rutgers, they're offering you a really good package, uh, much better than perhaps with TCNJ or Mother Patterson's Okay? But I really want to go to TCNJ. Okay? And we need to be ready to borrow or pay more money because Rutgers has the better option, of course. Okay? So, you know, usually the admissions conversations are the next ones. Yeah, I got in. Everybody's happy. They're posting, you know. Financial aid conversations are like, oh, bummer, man. I'm going to pay all this money. Okay, so it's, it's data, it's facts, it's numbers. So yes, it is cold and dry, okay? But again, it all comes down to this. Keep in mind, the formats may vary by institution. And what I mean by that is, some schools are still old school and they're gonna actually gonna send you by US mail, you know, an actual packet, you know, with the financial aid award notice, perhaps any conditions, you know, for merit scholarships. Oh, you gotta have a 3-0 do a certain number of credits every year if you want this to renew, you know, handy brochures about how to plan and budget yourself out and all that stuff. Some other schools, like my school, what we basically do is we notify the student via email. And we say, your financial aid package is ready to be viewed through your school's portal. When they're accepted, they are uh, given a portal to our school where all the information uh, that they need to view or receive or submit can be done through that portal. So that's how we do it. So again, it varies by format. So, uh, as the parent of a college freshman, I can tell you that one of my biggest uh, struggles with my son was read your damn emails. You should be reading your emails maybe every other day. But sometimes you go for weeks. And I'm like, dude, this has been sitting there for two weeks and it was time sensitive. They're asking you for information to complete your application or your FAFSA stuff or whatever. So it's gotten a little better, you know. But again, they should be monitoring that email religiously. That's how the colleges communicate with students. We make postings on Instagram or all those other fancy things, but in the end, it's all email. 
That's what we use. So they should be monitoring that email. Okay? It's available after the FAFSA is filed and the student is accepted. I covered that. And obviously, it is used to prepare aid package. But just a couple of things to be aware of. Okay? So the first one is any conditions for institutional aid or scholarships. So again, we go back to Johnny. The school said, hey, we want you. We're going to offer you $40,000 in a scholarship. And the way it works at TCNJ is we say $10,000 per year, each year over the four years. And we will send the student a contract that says you must maintain a 3.0 GPA, and you must complete a certain number of credits every year. If you do not do that or meet that, you lose the scholarship. Okay? So that's the first thing you need to be on the lookout for. If your sons and daughters are eligible for any institutional funding, what is the criteria, the renewal criteria to keep that money? Is the school telling you you need to keep it 3.75 as an engineer to maintain that? You're like, oof, keep it 3.0 as an engineer is tough enough. Now you're going to want a 3.75? Okay. Or, oh, we want you to complete 18 credits every semester. 15 credits is the standard loan. Any of the conditions, okay, that you know make that scholarship renewal. Is the scholarship evaluated every year when you submit the FAFSA, or is it locked after that first year and I'm guaranteed to get the 10, 10, 10, and 10 till their senior year? Okay? So note that. Alright? We lock ours, and if you get a two hundred thousand dollar raise the next year, then God bless you, but your scholarship's been locked. We're not gonna re-review it. Okay, but another school may. All right. Will outside scholarships impact institutional aid? Okay, so I'll use another personal example here. So my son, we were very fortunate, Virginia Tech gave him a merit scholarship. But they said, if you receive any outside funding, you're required to report that to us, but then we will decrease your merit scholarship. Okay? It's all got to fit within their merit scholarship criteria. At TCNJ, we stack those scholarships. So let's say we gave you 10, but then Coca Cola and they gave you two. So now we stack the two on top of the 10. Let's say you went to your Rotary, you belong to the Rotary Club and you got a $500 scholarship. Guess what? You got it? Now it's up to 12.5. So we stack them, we do not decrease them. So obviously what happened was, like any good parent, I signed up for all those scholarship sites too, and I would get the notifications. But I was like, why am I going to apply? And for full disclosure, it was $5,500 a year. So I'm like, why am I going to apply for a $2,000 scholarship and go through this whole rigmarole when they're going to decrease it? So I'm like, the only scholarship I'm going to apply for has got to be like $7,500, $10,000, 12000 because if he gets that, then I'll be like, fine. I don't care if I lost the $5,500 because now I got ten. dollars or 12 out of the deal. You see? So that's what you, another thing you have to be careful of. Do they stack or do they decrease the institutional fund? Okay? And our scholarships from them. So, <coughs> using the example again of the 40,000. 40,000 over four years, we divided 10, 10, 10, and 10. All right? But a school may say, well, we're going to make the first year's package real interesting and it's going to look really good. We're going to take that 40, we're going to give them 20 their first year. Okay, and then it's 10, and then 5, and 5. All right? So now you're like you're looking at that letter, you're like, man, this looks really good. You know, budgeting, we only have to come out this much out of pocket, or payment plan, or a loan, comparing it to another school. But guess what? They front loaded that scholarship. That second year, 10,000 of that is gone because they front loaded it to you. Okay, so again, things to be aware of, all right? But there's more. All right, does the school package to need? So again, going back, let me go back a couple of slides here. So will the school automatically give you that $15,000 at the state school or that $45,000 at the private school? Some schools do that. They say, whatever your need is, we're gonna package you with that much aid, that much free money, okay? So schools don't. We don't at TCMJ. Okay, so that's another thing to be on the lookout for. Do they package to need? Does the school package with parent loans? Okay, 
we only package whatever the student is eligible for, including student loans. But another school may say, no, we're packaging like that, but we're also expecting the parent to borrow $20,000 a year in a loan. Okay? So again, one financial aid package may look really good, but you don't realize that there's a $20,000 parent loan in there. While the other one, you're like, well, they're a little bit less, you know, or whatever, and you're like, oh, but there's no parent loan over here. So you got to compare those two. Okay? And does the school award merit need-based aid or both? Do schools give both? Some schools say, you know what? We don't award any need. We're going to award only merit money. So if your son or daughter has a really strong uh, high school record, then they're going to get money. Need? No. Some other schools do the opposite. They say, we package only for need. You can have a 5.0, a perfect SAT. You could be five AP classes transferring. Like, wow. You know, four varsity letters, sport, you know, all that stuff. And they're like, we don't package any merit money. Okay? So that's another thing you have to be on the lookout for, depending on the type of school you want to go to. Okay? So after all that, so in New Jersey, all colleges and universities are required to use one standard uh, award format. And it's called the College Financing Plan. Okay? Now, out in New Jersey, some schools may use a format that looks like the New Mexico one, which I kind of like it because it's simple. But in New Jersey, we're required to use this one. So obviously, if you're studying in New Jersey, it's relatively simple because you know that you're going to get something from Rutgers, from TCNJ, from William Patterson, from Stockton, whatever. You're going to be able to compare those award notices across the board. It's comparing apples to apples because we all use the same format. We all use the same conditions that I made you aware of. Okay? Where you have to be careful is if you're going out of state. Because the out of state schools could use any format they want. And that's where you're going to have to really scrutinize those award letters to go, all right, what are the conditions? How are they packaging? Are student loans in here? Are parent loans in here? Things like that. So again, in New Jersey, it's pretty simple. Now, that doesn't mean that an out of state school may use this. But in New Jersey, it's mandatory. And outside of New Jersey, it's not. Okay? So again, just keep that in mind. I like the uh, financing plan because on the top it has the costs, it has scholarship money, it has grant money, and then it tells you net costs. So how much are you paying after the free money? And then it'll give you loan options and work options, so it breaks everything uh, out, okay? So again, just keep in mind the format because if you're not confused enough by getting an award notice, applying, now you're gonna get a format and the formats are gonna be different too. So you really have to scrutinize that, all right? Section four, other information. So the main thing I would probably tell you here is you gotta be proactive. Your sons and daughters should be going out to the school's website. They should be looking at not only application deadlines, but also financial aid deadlines. They really need to be monitoring their emails. They need to be responding to requests for additional information. They should know the cycle. This is the hot time between now and February, and you're doing all this, okay? I would probably tell you that, you know, Common has been open since August, so I don't know if you uh, filled that out yet, but I would probably tell you that admissions takes priority right now. So you should be doing finalizing all your admission stuff, transcripts, things like that, with the guidance office, and then immediately after that, you need to be looking at those financial aid deadlines and filling out the financial aid form, okay? You really should look at all the deadlines for the different colleges, and whatever college has the earliest deadline, just make sure you do your FAFSA by that deadline and you include all the colleges on the FAFSA. Because you've met every deadline, okay? Because February to April, that's when schools are not only in some cases sending out their award notices, although some schools do it earlier, but traditionally February through April is when schools are sending out all their financial aid award packages, okay, for you to compare. Traditionally, that's when you're doing a second visit to the school, you're perhaps meeting with the financial aid office on campus going, here's what you offered me, thinking of coming here, what other options are there, you're doing a four-year plan, you're budgeting out, am I going to be able to afford my, to send my son and daughter here for four years, things like that. Because at most schools, May 1 is decision day. That's deposit day, that's the day you got to secure your seat, okay? So perhaps at a less competitive school, they may say, well, you got till May 15th, you got till June 1 to do your deposit. I can tell you at TCNJ, May 1st is the day. 
if you miss May 1st, you don't have a seat. And if that was really where you wanted to go, you are out of luck. Okay? There's a lot of schools that are like that. I can tell you Virginia Tech was like that with my son. Okay? So you got to make that decision. That's why you got to make sure all that stuff is solidified by May 1st. Because some schools are very cutthroat with this is decision made May 1st. Okay? And because then, come June to August, you're going to be doing orientations, your schedules, term bills are due, you're finalizing your A, you got to make sure those bills are paid so that your son and daughter can move into their campus residence. Okay? So, I've been through it, folks. It's a wild year. But then it's over and it's nice. Alright, special circumstances. So, if you saw, you're filling out, the seniors in the room are filling out a FAFSA for 23-24 for the school year that begins in August. You are using 2021 income information. So think about that. By the time your sons and daughters are attending school, it's almost been two years since that income information has been valid. Okay? So just know if there has been a significant reduction in the household income, but a lot of schools have a process, uh, it's called professional judgment in our language, but we call it special circumstances. Where the school, if you meet certain situations, the school is allowed to reevaluate the income you reported on the FAFSA and see if your new income, if it's lower obviously, would make any impact on the eligibility. Okay? So I've kind of given you the standard ones that most schools use. You know, obviously, you were, both parents were working in 21, and now one of them is unemployed. Uh, both parents were working, uh, but one was working overtime or working a second job, and now that is gone. Okay, those extra hours are gone. Disability. Dad was on the work site, he fell off the ladder, and he's either temporarily disabled, disabled, you know, six months, or permanent disability. Okay? One of the parents decided, you know, I'm retired. I'm done. Okay, 2021, both are working now, one's retired. So I'm giving you kind of examples that most schools use. Okay, that doesn't mean there may be others, but this is a school specific process. Okay, so you're still required to do the FAFSA with 21. You still are required to report that. You're still required to package you. But if you are like, you know what, I remember Will talking something about if I lost my job or my income has changed then you need to go out to the specific college's website to see what their process for a reevaluation is and see what forms they require and what additional documentation is required. I can tell you if you went to the TCNJ homepage, on the left is the special circumstances link. You click on it, I have a humongo jungle webpage that describes the process. I have all the situations we accept, the form that's corresponding, and all the documentation that's required. Okay? Most schools have such a process. Okay? So just keep that in mind. This is more just a, I remember there was a reevaluation. What are the options for reevaluation? Other resources that you should be looking into. Obviously, you know, one of the things we mentioned, I wish I had this one. No, I don't. Uh, you know, folks, this is a four year plan. You're like trying to figure out, are we going to be able to afford college for the next four years? Even though you've done your FAFSA only for one year and you're required to do it every year, you got to figure out, all right, if things stay relatively the same and the financial aid package stays the same, as freshman year, how are we going to be able to budget ourselves for four years and afford this, okay? Without having to mortgage your house, you know? So again, you should be looking at outside scholarships. And I'm going to give you reputable scholarship sites on the next slide. You know, payment plans, although they're not part of financial aid, a lot of folks take advantage of payment plans. They're interest-free. It's a very low fee to enroll. You can spread out the payments over 10 months. So it's a nice, viable option. Campus employment, you're going to be evaluated for work study in a lot of cases. If the student wants to work on campus, they can indicate that on the FAFSA, and they can perhaps get a job on campus that will help supplement, you know, buy their books. They can pay it every two weeks like a normal job on campus. Specialized campus opportunities, uh, I always thought the uh, residential advisor one. Uh, basically, if you are hired as a residential advisor at TCNJ, you get to live in the dorm for free, and you get a stipend for his meal plan. Traditionally, that, those jobs are reserved for upperclassmen. Uh, traditionally, juniors and seniors, but sometimes sophomores get it. But right now, my housing on campus is about $12,000 for the year. And my meal plan is another $2,000 and something, okay? 
So imagine if your sons and daughters are able to get a job being a residential advisor, that's potentially a twelve to fourteen thousand dollar in your savings that they're giving you on that bill. Okay? Plus it's you know experience, they're getting a job and all that stuff. Okay? Uh, jobs as student ambassadors, student tour guides, internship co-ops, some schools do what we're called co-ops where um, I'll give you an example, Drexel University, my, my neighbor went there. Uh, junior year, they said, well, junior year, you go work. You know, as part of you getting credits for college, you're actually working, and that income that you're earning hopefully will go to help cover your expenses. Okay? So that, that's how they worked it out of Drexel. Private scholarship search. Again, you can go to most colleges, universities, the ones that you're applying to, and look for their private scholarship searches, private scholarship pages. If you went to mine, it opens up like a, uh, it's like a 17, 18 page PDF document with like three or four different scholarship sources on each page, okay? Uh, you know, local businesses, civic organizations, probably one of your best ones is the high school, that is helpful. Do you guys use Naviance or Score? Yeah, so Naviance, they usually post scholarships on Naviance, so you should definitely check to see what scholarships are posted. Uh, another one is, Check your, your job, okay? Whether it's the student or the parent. Go to the HR office and check on your job. You might be surprised how many employers out there give scholarships. My uncle, I remember back in the day, my uncle worked for AT&T. I mean, he had been at AT&T forever. And finally, my cousin was gonna go to college. And out of whim, he just went to HR. And they were like, yeah, as a matter of fact, we have a scholarship for children of employees here. And he was able to get, you know, I don't know if it was like two grand or something out of them, but I was like, Wow, somebody wants to give me 2K, sign me up, you know? So again, what's the worst that can happen? They say, unfortunately, we do not, but at least you asked, okay? Any civic organizations you belong to, any clubs, organizations, ask them, your church, temple, wherever you go, okay? Reach out, ask them to see. Again, they may have scholarships. And these are reputable scholarship sites that you can go to and do some research and sign up. I signed up for the fast web one, and they, they send me emails every day. Um, it's okay, you know, it's okay, but at least I get emails and I can kind of scrutinize uh, myself. And then he's the services. So what, what happens is, you know, I work at the college in New Jersey, and I come out and do these presentations, but basically what happens is I come out here on, on behalf of the state as an outreach. Okay, the state uh, hires, you know, consultants throughout the state who work in the community and do these financial aid nights just to do hours. So the state of New Jersey is available to you as a New Jersey resident as a resource. So if you ever have any questions about financial aid in general, applying for financial aid, about colleges in New Jersey, about how student loans work, you can always call ESA. You've got their email there. You've got their customer service line. It's a service that's available to you as a New Jersey resident, as a taxpaying New Jersey resident. Okay? And finally, how many of you are overwhelmed? It's a lot, right? So look, I've given the presentation to the school. I'm assuming you'll post it or distribute it. You can refer back to it. Do your admission stuff first, because that's priority, and then immediately after, do your financial.